we have gotten an early look at this book, which is uh, talking about the 50 years of the Asian Development Bank. We're just now passing the 50 year anniversary. First of all, congratulations on the achievement of producing this. Yeah, it took us uh, almost uh, three years to produce this book because uh, we wanted to make this book a kind of history of ADB, but also about history of evolutions of Asian uh, economy in these uh, 50 years. There's a uh, remarkable chart in this book where you show from the year 1900 mm -hmm. to around 1950, 1960 mm -hmm. per capita income, mm -hmm. and it's basically flat. It's not That's moving. Right. That's right. And in fact, around the time the Asian Development Bank was founded, mm -hmm. I think poverty in Asia was worse than in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's right. much worse than yeah, in Latin yeah, America. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Per capita GDP basis, it, it was much poorer. Korea, for instance, was poorer than Ghana and so on. But uh, overall, it is becoming more market-oriented, more prudent uh, macroeconomic policies. And uh, compared to the Latin America, uh, the period of inflation was more limited. And the Asian crisis was there, but uh, Asian economies are, are becoming more and more uh, prudent about macroeconomic policies, invest more in the infrastructure, and uh, took care of uh, difficult issues between countries. And over time, it is uh, becoming a more solid place for growth. And you can see that in the trajectory on that chart, where per, income, per capita income has shot up in most countries in the region. That's right. And uh, of course, uh, there are many challenges, like uh, increased inequality. Uh, 330 million people are still under the absolute poverty of 1.9 a dollar a day, and uh, gender equality should be improved, mm -hmm. private sector should be promoted. There are many challenges. That's why we are here still. And I think another thread throughout the book is that your role as a regional integrator. That's right. That some of the projects that are so complex mm -hmm. because you need to get various countries to, to really work mm -hmm. together, you need an institution that's, that's right. multilateral. The amount of money may be less important, but the role you can play bringing those groups together is critical. It's really true. So. The, uh, I, I, emphasize, I emphasize in this book that uh, Asian development itself is a kind of a child of uh, the idea of regional cooperation. Asian countries should uh, uh, come together. So at that, uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, China, People's uh, Republic of China, was not our member. Taipei China was a member. And uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, those countries are a little bit uh, isolated, although they were founding members. Because of conflicts, they couldn't uh, uh, come closer to other countries uh, for some time. But over time, they are more integrated. And ADB uh, could provide a basis for this uh, regional cooperation. So ADB itself is a regional cooperation. But at the same time, we try to promote sub-regional initiatives like uh, in greater Mekong sub-regions. So in 1990s, early 1990s, we started this project because there was a transition happening. So how to integrate these newcomers in a better ways, and also connectivity by highways and railways and so on between uh, east and west and uh, south and north of the uh, uh, Mekong region. That would make this region more prosperous, but also more stable in this global uh, society now. There are so many uncertainties. Asia is uh, relatively more stable, but at the same time, uh, we should be careful that how to manage these uh, uh, issues uh, between countries, for instance. That is a very important challenge. It is a complex time. And in fact, one of the things that you've done mm -hmm. in a complex time when there's the inability to raise lots of new funding from donor governments mm -hmm. is you found a new approach, which is merging the mm -hmm. capital that you use to make traditional loans with the concessional That's loan, right. Asian Development Fund. It was quite a controversial, quite a difficult decision. The book details some of that. Yeah, Give us the insider view. What was it like to actually merge those two balance sheets together and create almost double or maybe 60% more lending uh, since you've done that? So we had uh, the uh, two windows. One is for concessional uh, operations. Uh, that is uh, uh, grant and uh, uh, concessional loans. And it has uh, it had, uh, the equity of uh, $30 billion. And on the other hand, we have an ordinary capital resource, which is for middle, uh, middle income countries and with a certain spread of uh, LIBOR. And it used a lot of leverage. So the uh, paid in capital was 7 billion. But over time, because of uh, income uh, build up, uh, it was uh, 17. But compared to ADF, uh, 30 billion dollars, which is for concession limited. And this 30 billion didn't use any leverage, right. which means that if we expand our outstanding lending, 
we should get more money for, from, uh, I mean, advanced economies and some emerging economies to lend to Vietnam, for instance. But does it make sense? Vietnam has been very good borrower. They have never, I mean, defaulted. So why do we need to keep our money just to re relent to those countries? We can use leverage, which means we can issue bond for this one. Why do we need to have a two separate windows? That is my basic idea. So there was an idea, but I thought as far as the ADF equity, equity is used for the original purpose of a donor's contribution, which is to support poor countries, to support poor people. We can merge it because these are two windows under one institution of ADB, and we can do it without the ch charter uh, treaties uh, changes. We can do it uh, uh, with the support of donors and shareholders of ADB. But you didn't get that support right away, right? You, you, this was a, a big idea. I know this mentioned in the book that one of your largest shareholders, the United States, gave you some immediate pushback. Tell us how that process went. Yeah, because in the uh, beginning, maybe they thought this is to use uh, soft windows equity, ADF equity, which is for the poor countries to use for middle income countries. But if uh, we think more carefully, by using leverage, we can support uh, countries with their concessional loans more because we use right. more leverage. You've increased the grants as well. And also we can increase our grants because we can gain more income uh, because of larger operations, and we can transfer that money to remaining ADF, it is only for grant. So we can increase all the elements of operations, uh, middle income countries, uh, non-concessional loans, concessional loans, and also grant operations by having bigger income based on the bigger leverage. And also uh, the donors would benefit because they don't need to uh, replenish and uh, replenish uh, ADF uh, every four years by a very large amount. They are faced with the uh, budget constraint. They must support uh, climate change. They must support so many things. So if we can do it in a more efficient way, using our balance sheet better. So once again, my basic idea is as far as we are bank, if uh, there is no serious credit risk, and there is no credit risk uh, as we expected in the beginning because these countries repaid well. Why don't we use leverage? And this is benefiting all the people, <laughs> para countries, middle income countries, and also donors. Why do we need to be against it? I'm, I'm sure this will end up being one of the big parts of your legacy, but I don't want to, I don't want to suggest your legacy is over. You just started <laughs> another term. You've got five more years, four and a half years left. What can we expect from the rest of your presidency? Is there anything that you're working on now that could be at the scale of this kind of merger that you created? I, I'm not so ambitious about uh, uh, what I can do uh, because my attitude is uh, I would do what I should do uh, at that moment. And at this moment, what I'm uh, caring about is uh, how to support COP21 initiative and we are doubling our climate finance. And to do it well, we must measure the impact of mitigations, adaptation. We cannot just, uh, I mean, make up uh, figures. So we must be careful about it. Another point is the uh, infrastructure uh, discussions. And as I said, uh, we uh, had a report of a uh, new measure of uh, infrastructure needs. That is $1.7 trillion a year for Asian developing countries. And we produced this report uh, using almost two, hour, two years because we wanted to discuss not just by the estimate of needs, but how it can be financed. And what is the record of financing these things? And what should be done in addition? So this is uh, uh, infrastructure development, which is discussed uh, in Washington a lot, G20 a lot. How to do it is uh, one of a very important uh, I mean, uh, interest of mine. And uh, how to use more advanced technologies in infrastructure. Because uh, countries are now middle-income countries, they want to pursue better technologies. And our finance is limited. So if we can share the uh, more advanced knowledge how to do things better with those countries, we can be more relevant. If we are just financing, they can issue their bond already. So how to integrate, uh, integrate better technologies in infrastructure? Uh, and it is uh, not to procure more from uh, advanced economies, but it is needed for 
boring countries. And uh, companies in Korea, China, and other emerging economies in India, those are also very innovative. And we should uh, induce those new technologies more by our procurement policies. I noticed in the book there was reference to the very first loan that was made by the bank and that it took one year. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's not that long if you think about how long it takes to prepare projects <laughs> now. Yeah. But as you say, the current situation is very different with mm -hmm. safeguards. Mm -hmm. Asia is moving fast. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the other key strategic choices you made was to embrace the two big new development banks in the area, mm -hmm. Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, New Development mm -hmm. Bank. Tell us about that choice, because a lot of people thought, including the Obama administration, that well, maybe these are not good, especially the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Maybe this is something we shouldn't engage with. You've taken the opposite approach. How has that played out so far? And, and tell us about your thinking. I think it is going very well. And uh, uh, about AIB, for instance, I met uh, Mr. Jing, the president of AIB, nine times in these two years bilaterally. Mm -hmm. uh, and we discussed a lot of issues, how to co-finance projects, what are the uh, important elements of uh, safeguard policies, and how can we strengthen our human resources ourselves? Because we need more, I mean, uh, sector expertise and so on. So how can we do it? And how we can make our uh, system more efficient? And what's the difference between these two institutions? Like uh, they don't have a resident board. We have a resident board of 12 uh, executive directors, 12 alternative uh, mm -hmm. directors. I believe it is needed for us because uh, the objective of development are so, uh, I mean, kind of wide-ranging. Wide so we need a lot of uh, opinions uh, from people who are based in Manila. That is my idea. So, but uh, his idea is it's better to be leaner. Mm -hmm. So that is one idea. So what I want to say is we are cooperating, co-financing, and discussing many issues very candidly based on the experiences of him and myself. With uh, Mr. Kamath of uh, New Development Bank, we already uh, agreed to the MOU also. And he's also a professional uh, banker, of course. And both of them are a ADB's, uh, I mean, uh, previous uh, empl employees. And uh, Mr. Jim was the vice president. Mr. Kamath was also a economist in the ADB. We can, uh, I mean, uh, cooperate. We can, we can work together in a very positive way. And there is a lot of needs of infrastructure. Why do we need to be confrontational? And of course, America and Japan didn't join AIB. It's their choice. Mm -hmm. There is a constraint of the budget, and they already made a lot of contribution to other institutions. Mm -hmm. So they decided to stay away. But it doesn't mean that we cannot cooperate. Well, thank you very much for all the time you put into this, for taking time to spend with us. Congratulations on it, and we look forward to a successful meeting in Yokohama. Thank you very much, and thank you for reading at least some part of this book. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.